Beginner runners always fail. And you know what? Good. You have to to learn more about yourself. And it's not just beginners, we all fail from time to time. I think what's more important than why is how runners fail. Because some failures should be avoided and some should be experienced. All right, this is a running channel, so there is probably gonna be a fair bit of running in this video. But I've gotta get started first. So I've got two things to tell you before we get started. And the first thing is, the way I'm gonna split this video down is, I'm gonna split it into experiences that you need to listen to people that are further down the road like me or the experts that write scientific papers so that you don't make these same mistakes. Then, I'm gonna tell you about the mistakes that you actually need to make, which sounds ridiculous. But there's a bunch of mistakes that I think are absolutely invaluable and absolutely best lived in running rather than just listen to someone else. In fact, it's, a, it's almost a rite of passage. And then the second thing is, we are literally 400, 400 subscribers away from 100,000 and getting our silver play button. So if you haven't subscribed to the channel, get us over the line. We've got some pretty banging videos in the pipeline for the next few weeks. So join the journey, get us to 100K. Nothing will actually happen, but it'll just feel really, really nice for everyone. Oh wait, actually one more point. Guess what's happening this time next week? No word of a lie. I and Mary are racing Elliot Kipchoge. Yeah, he's standing on the start line of the amazing Thailand 10K. And guess what? So are we in the fast runner section. So we'll be standing right next to him. And if you want to see that video, then you're definitely gonna have to wait till next week and subscribe. Okay, on with this video, on with it. All right, let's take the first scenario where you need to listen rather than live. <clears throat> Remember, this is just me down the line wishing that someone had done this for me when I started in my running journey too long ago. I won't even calculate the time. But put your hands up if you do this. Like You have to be honest. And you have to tell me in the comments if you've done it or still do it. Every run, when you go out, you try and run faster than the last one as some kind of strange way of proving that you are getting fitter and better as a runner. So trying to run a PB in every run. Come on, fess up, because I know I did and I know I used to make notes of it when I first started. And here's the thing, how long is that gonna last? Let's be honest, how long are you gonna keep getting faster until you're what? Elliot Kipchoge level, faster? There's gonna come a point when you're not gonna be able to run faster than the last session. And then what happens in here? I've actually known people in my own life, cycling and running, that have tried to go faster in each session than they have in the session before and ended up being highly anxious and actually not even wanting to go out and run or cycle, almost losing that joy because they know the pressure that comes with the session because if they don't prove that they're faster than that last session, it means that they're not as good an athlete or they're going backwards. And that is it's just not how fitness works, not how life works. So rather than go through that process yourself, I really genuinely believe this one doesn't have to be lived. This one should be learned and listened to from people down the line in terms of experience. Don't go out and try and run a PB every run. Much better, take it easy, relax, build your base. Maybe once a week or once a fortnight if you really feel like you want to run a fast run, then, then do that. But don't overthink it don't try and run faster in each run because there's no real benefit there the thing is I just don't want you to lose a whole first year of training or a season of training doing this because what can come of it is burnout anxiety injury let me save you the hassle here's one that most definitely shouldn't be lived it should be listened to and that is that runners who just run <coughs> have a lot lot shorter shelf life. But the problem is that you're not gonna see that shelf life until it's too late. So this is what I'm talking about. Gym mats, kettlebells, dumbbells, more gym mats, massagey things, massagey thing, resistance bands, resistance bands, Pilates bands, Pilates ball. And here's the thing about all of this is that do I use it all? No. Do I use some of it? Yeah. Some of the time? Yeah. Don't use it all the time, but I'm trying. And the point here is that when you run, 
You can get away with just running for a pretty long time. That doesn't mean you should do it. I have to put this all away now. And the thing is, you're gonna see benefit from doing strength work whilst you're running, but you're not gonna see the true benefits until way later on. So by investing just like a little bit of strength and conditioning in your day, in your week, consistently over a period of months and years is like investing in a pension. <clears throat> you see, the point of like a monetary pension for me is, is not so that you can have money right now in my life right now, it's so that I can be comfortable in later life. And that's a monetary financial pension. What we're talking about is a physical pension, as in do all the things now that, that probably will benefit you a little bit now. But in truth, what you're doing is you're investing daily for a more comfortable physical life when you're older. And here's the catch you see, when you get to 70 or 80, I'm telling you this, the fact that you doubled down and you did strength and conditioning is not only going to allow you to have a much more comfortable life when you're older, it's going to allow you to stay in the running game. So I've never really bought into this attitude of like, I don't do strength and conditioning or I don't stretch because I don't think you'll see much difference or a huge amount of difference between me and someone who doesn't do it, but I suspect that in 30 years down the line, or 30 years if you're my age, mid 40s, 30 years down the line is when you're gonna see the difference. It's not right now. So this is not falling under the category of I need to live this experience to really truly appreciate how beneficial it is for me, because that would be too late if you don't do it. This is one where you need to listen to the experts, by the way, not me, invest in it, and then in 30 or 40 years, just write me, if I'm still alive, write me a, a, a letter of thanks. Now the final mistake that needs to be listened to rather than experienced is that of recovery. But what is recovery? Like, what does it look like? But maybe before we talk about what recovery looks like, we should probably talk about what it looks like if you're not recovering enough so that you can identify with that because I'm pretty sure there are a lot of us out there. So do you recover enough? With beginner runners, it tends to be that you, you get the bug, you start running, you love running, so you run a lot. And in fact, you feel great because you've just started running. Your body's not kind of used to bigger volumes yet. But here's the thing, we're trying to do this for life, right? We're not just trying to do this for the short term. And what recovery, as in not running on a day or over a shorter period of time, like taking a week off, what it does is it allows the body to repair and it allows the body to rebuild even stronger. So by continually running, because we feel great, we love it, we're actually not doing the bit that allows our body to get stronger, which allows us to get faster so we've got to factor in recovery which brings us back to what is recovery obviously the easiest form of recovery is rest but in a study published as recently as this year in sports medicine around the effectiveness of recovery strategies after training and racing <laughs> what they found was that you can do a lot more than just not run to aid your recovery. So Mary, you'll be interested to know what they discovered that one of the effective recovery strategies was cryotherapy. Another one was compression leggings or the, what do we call them? Compression boots. The compression boots that we have. Good. Massage, patchy, in terms of evidence for recovery, it wasn't consistent. None of them were, that's the trick, but they all had some benefit to recovery. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to hold it together because it's very cold. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to butcher the conclusion of the study like only I can once I've gone on. Oh my God, that's so cold. Right, come on, come on. But I think what the study is getting at is that cryotherapy, compression leggings, massages, they're all variable. <laughs> struggling to think now. They all have a varying degree of effectiveness depending on the person, so it's completely individual on how you recover, but what it does conclude is that recovery methods do work and it is worth it. So you have to find what works for you, but it does work. And so it's definitely not an experience that you should try and live first and not recover. You should listen to the experts and the scientific papers and go from there. Okay. This is so cold. Let's move on to the experiences and the mistakes that you actually have to live. 
But I'm not going. I'm not going back under, Mary. <laughs> She's the other side of the camera, going go under. <laughs> no, it would not. <laughs> it's Thursday night, and that can only mean one thing in the Bridges household. It's date night, kind of. It's our run date night. Finishing with a Picari sweat. And while we're on the run, I thought what we would talk through is the three bits of advice that I want to give you, but I think that you have to live. So I don't want you to just listen to me and not do these. I actually think you've got to do them. So what I'm going to tell you is three mistakes that actually I think you have to make. You have to live. You don't listen to us and just not do them. I think you've got to make them and, and there's good reason behind that. You're not going to thank me for this, by the way, but the first mistake I think you need to make, and I've made them, Mary's made them, at every distance, is that you have to go out above your ability in a race. You have to go out too hard and you actually, <laughs> you have to blow up. So it sounds grim and it is grim, but I truly believe having done it at 5K, 10K, half marathon and marathon, without knowing where the line is on any given day for you, without knowing where your limit is, you don't know how hard to push. So you only know how hard to push when you push too hard. And that's it, isn't it? How many times have you had someone say to you, now take it easy at the start of the marathon, you're gonna feel good. Mary, have you done that? Have you had that advice and then still gone hard? Oh yeah, and I've done it, and redone it, and redone it. And it is really painful, but you can only really learn that through experience. You have to live it. My first half marathon here was, uh, was a pretty torrid affair that scarred me for a long while, in fact, where I went out at the same pace I would have done in the UK and blew up in the most spectacular way, almost dreading half marathons for a little while after. But I really learned so much about my body in that moment that no one could have told me I had to live it. And to be fair, even New York Marathon and Boston Marathon, I probably still went a little bit too hard, even though I was way down the line in my running journey. I know all the advice. I even listened to all my advice and I still blew up. And so I still learned so much about myself that allowed me to run a 244 in Chicago. So yeah, it's a constant journey. It's not a pretty one, but it is a learning one. Another mistake that I think you really have to learn through experience is going wrong with your food, your nutrition, your calorie intake. And that could be taking on too much or taking on too little. Speaking of food, I wish you could smell that. Oh my God, it's awesome. That does smell great. Fueling is really specific and individual to your body, but you've really got to make sure you've eaten enough to give you the energy to race. Here are some of the times that I've totally messed up. Number one, Bangkok Marathon, night race. I ate the wrong kinds of carbs compared to what I'm used to in training. And I suffered badly with cramps, stitches. My stomach was all over the place. So from that, I learned that I need to practice the right carbs before race and know what my body works well on. Why did you eat the wrong carbs? You haven't said that. I said it was a night race. No, but you didn't say because usually before a race you would eat breakfast yeah. and you ate dinner instead. Yeah, I ate chicken and rice. My body was like, no thanks. they work. Number two, Boston Marathon. I did not carb load enough and I just didn't have energy on the day, which was painful for another reason. But that lesson got me learning properly about the carb load and how to nail it and I got it right the next time in Chicago. The third one is a big overall example of eating and fueling yourself for life and being a runner within that. It took me a long time to get there. I had years of under fueling and not having the right energy and it's been a real process of working out what works for me, what energizes me and what gives me the best balance. So I can't tell you what to eat, it's very individual, but you've got to really work out the right fueling to get the most out of your life and your running. And the final kind of lived lesson that I suppose you have to go through rather than me tell you is that maybe you need to go out and be frustrated on a few runs and races where you don't push hard enough. You need to finish those races and be like, ah, oh, do you know what? There was more in the tank. Or you need to come back from a hard session and be like, I think I undersold myself there because it's the flip side of pushing too hard but you don't know how to find the line until you're under or over it. Hold up Mary, I just wanna really hammer home this point because sometimes when you're running and you think you are running at your hardest, 
you might not be. Mm. So how do you know when you're running under your line and over your line? Well, you have to rely on the data a little bit. Mm. When you're running, if you look at your heart rate data, you know, match it with your effort data, and if you think that you're running your hardest, maybe compare it to a race where perhaps you also ran your hardest and see if there is a difference in your heart rate. Because what often happens is we undersell ourselves. We think we are working really hard where in fact we probably had another level above it if there was an element of competition in there. Yeah. The heart rate data will definitely kind of unlock and show you stuff like that. Yeah, I think the human body will naturally try and keep you comfortable and protect yourself a little bit, but if you don't really push yourself, you're not gonna reach your full potential in your running. We better go. So by all means, go out there on races and have a day where you think you could have gone harder. Go out there on hard sessions and have a session where you think, I probably could have gone harder. But do not go out on easy runs and be like, I'm gonna push harder. Because yeah. that's a different ball game altogether. We need to get our Picari sweat, don't we? It's getting dark. <laughs> bonus lived experience that I'm going to throw in there at the end. It wasn't planned, but now we picked up our Bakari sweat is you can't live anybody else's amazing runs. You can't live anybody else's runs that kind of make it all worthwhile, I guess. And these types of runs for us, even though it's only seven kilometers, you know, you can't put a price on how happy they make us, right? Yeah. Mm. And how happy drinking Bakari spread Bacari Sprat. We're not even spot. We're not That's sponsored by these. We are, we are not sponsored by Bacari Sweat. We just love it. So if they want to sponsor it, we're all on board. Yeah, we're ready and waiting for the offer. Oh, dark. Who's smug now though? I walked a little bit, but didn't stop my watch because I don't usually. And Mary did, so she's running now up the road like a bit of a demented pigeon. Look, turn in the corner. Gotta get that round number. Yeah. Run done. Oh, I forgot to stop my watch. Hey! That's this starting run done. And hopefully this video has helped you enough to consider subscribing to the channel. Or if you liked the video, you're definitely gonna like this one here. And remember, in a week's time, we're racing Kipchoge. So that's gonna be a banging video to hopefully get us over the line.